If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me. Uh, I'm going to really cut out our interpreter here this morning because, uh, sister, you're going to kill me, I know. God changed my message about 10 minutes ago. I had no time to talk to you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to be as concise as I can. And, uh, that way, God will bless you as you use your ministry all we'll soon. I don't often do that, but I felt so impressed this morning that, uh, that God wanted to, this scripture preached on, and I want to share it with you. Luke chapter 4. I uh, don't want you to forget while you're turning to your text. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that this evening, Teen Challenge of Western Pennsylvania will be with us ministry, special song. Uh, drama, and uh, these are young men that have been delivered from alcohol, drugs, God is beginning to work in their lives, and so we're looking forward to the service this evening, the youth department is uh, sponsoring this, and we thank the Lord for their interest, and then also, I'm going to meet with all the nominees tonight for office, in the side room at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Don't forget also that uh, um, our annual business meeting is coming up on February 1st. And we encourage all members to be here. This is a very important meeting each year for our church. Uh, we look at not only the state of our church financially, but voted in officers as well as the overall pairs that need to be talked about. So don't forget our annual business meeting being at 7 o'clock February 1st, Wednesday evening, which is this coming Wednesday night of the week. We see that night. Luke chapter 4. I'd like to begin reading verse 20, if I may. We have been enjoying a, a touch of God in our church. And recently, we've been experiencing God dealing with individuals. And somebody made the statement to me, even about last Sunday night, that the service was a deep service. It, it, was, it was something that lasts. And how God dealt with people in our church and several baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and how God did it. I watched the Holy Spirit move in waves just across the audience. It was almost like a line moving across the church as the Holy Spirit began to touch people as He moved through the audience. So it was just a wonderful service. And I, I'm convinced, folks, that God wants to do miracles among His people. But we have to remember that God does use people. We often look at miracles as an instigation of God that appears out of nowhere. And a big bolt of lightning comes down and all of a sudden, we've got a miracle. But see, God works miracles just like He works healings, just like He draws people in salvation. God, it's almost utterly impossible in this church age for people to get saved unless God uses a channel to give the word. The Bible says without the knowledge of the word, there can be no conviction. There's no way that people can be saved without the word of God. And so unless God is looking for channels to use for his miracle working power. And I'm convinced there are illustrations in the Bible where this is so clear. Notice verse 20. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearts. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, 
ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, talking about the drought, when great famine was throughout all that land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure whether you understand uh, uh, the, the depth of this scripture. But what Jesus was telling the church people and the leaders of the synagogue was that in all the people that were ministered to, only two of them were used. He was saying this to the church. He was saying, unless you are usable material, God will go to somebody else. We will miss the best God has for us. And I'm convinced this morning that God wants to use every believer in miracle working power. I'm convinced today that we don't have to, I say this with all, with tremendous uh, honor and, and I don't want to step out of line at all here. I believe in our great evangelists uh, that, that are on TV and radio and I love the ministry that God's given them. But folks, it isn't the big name. It's not the big cathedral. It's not that place you have to go to to get your touch from God. I believe God can anoint your wife, sir. God can anoint your husband, lady. God can anoint your children to lay hands on you and pray the prayer of faith and you will be made everyone holy. Amen. It needs to be done in the local church. It needs to be evident. How can it be done? Our pastors, you might say, need to be Spirit-filled. Yes, we do. We need to be adherent to what God is doing in the church. But ladies and gentlemen, the preacher and the pastoral staff is not responsible to do all this work. It is the responsibility of the laity of the church to get into the Holy Ghost and to be used by the power of God. And when something arises in your home or in your family, you can challenge that disease you can challenge that thing in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. Yes. My Bible seems to teach something will happen. Am I correct? Yes. Something will happen. Verse 27 says, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Isaiah. And then down in verse 28. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way and came down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath day. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was Power. His word was with power. Heavenly Father, bless your word this morning and make it real to our hearts. God, I believe there's something you want to do. It's one thing, Lord, for us to get filled with the Holy Ghost. It's another thing, Lord, for us to get refilled. And it's yet another thing for us to take advantage of that touch of God and not just wait for another touch, but to be used by the power of God and to be instruments of righteousness for Jesus Christ. 
Miracles need to be done in this town and all over this community, Lord. And it is up to us as we scatter after each service to go our individual way and to touch those round about us in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced, Lord, that if we use Your name and we do it honestly and our lives are upright and right with God, You will honor our prayer and You'll do miracles in our midst and we'll see miracles accomplished on the streets of Mount Morris and in this, in this county and surrounding counties, God, this church will touch people that have never been touched before and it won't be done by the pastor. What I'm convinced will be done by the way. So Lord, you touch our minds today. Help us to hear your word, Lord. May we put it into our lives and Divine miracles by ordinary people. Divine miracles by ordinary people. I think the thoughts have been over the years that miracles are only done by ordained ministers. Now you think about what I'm saying. Miracles are only done by the men that are in the pulpit. Or the men that are ministering at any given time. But I'm convinced today that there were more miracles done by ordinary people in the Bible than by anybody else. And all the years that entailed the Word of God, Jesus only walked on this earth three and a half years. Out of all that time, Jesus walked three and a half years. Who did these miracles? We know that individuals don't actually do the healing. We know that individuals don't actually take away the disease. We know that individuals don't actually save people, but we become instruments for the power, the miracle working power of God. And I believe today that God wants us to be the light of the world. And those miracles happen through and in us, first in us and then through us. And every one of us become an instrument of God. You must be usable. This reminds me of a little story. I heard about somebody that was trying to get ahead. Over an accident settlement, Tom was sitting in court. And the judge looked down and said, How are you, Tom? I'm bad off, judge, said Tom. I'm bad off. Well, the judge said in the police report, it states that you said you were fine. Even though your mule didn't make it. Well, Tom said, on my way home with my mule and cart, I went to turn off in my driveway and a big semi-tractor trailer hit us and knocked us in the ditch. <coughs> when I came to, Joe, the state trooper, was there, his blue light flashing. And so he walked over and he checked my mule and because he was hurt, he took out his revolver and he shot him. Then he walked over with gun in hand and looked at me. And I cried, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> you know, it takes a little more depth than that, doesn't it? <laughs> to do the work of the Lord. It takes a little more depth. And if I want to have strength in knowing that God can use me in a miracle, that I've got to look to the Word of God. Jesus here gave an example. The people got full of wrath. These church leaders says, you're insulting us. You stand in our midst and you tell us in so many words that we're not worthy to be used by the power of God. Who do you think you are? the same thing that's going on in our society today. I'm convinced we cannot stand by and listen to people say it doesn't matter what kind of God you serve. It can be Buddha. It can be somebody else. I'm convinced we got to know there is only one God. There is only one Jesus Christ. Yes. And if we try serving any other God, well, it'll be alright. Even though it's another name, it's still, it's still God. No, it isn't. My Bible tells me there is one name under heaven whereby you might be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. 
It's the only name. There is no other source for salvation. There is no other source, my Bible tells me, to get healing for my body. There is no other source to be free from habitual habits that come into our life. You can go through programs, and these are great, and some of you sitting in this church have done it if you're not now doing it. I know what you're talking about. And I know that they're good. But there's only one final break away. And that is when the Holy Spirit takes the craving. Amen. And you no longer get it. Can you say it? Amen. No longer get it. You no longer want it anymore. Amen. When He takes it away, they call this a miracle. I'm reminded of a few examples in the Word of God today. I remember the little wo uh, widow woman in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you'd like to turn with me, that'll be just fine. 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning with verse 9. We want to remember all those who aren't with us. We're already down about a hundred and some in Sunday school today, so we want to pray all those get back. We know some of those side roads are real bad. Pray for them that God will keep them in His care. Also, just a, a matter of question, is Brother Jack Kluge here today? Brother Jack, stay and give us a testimony. Bro. Sure. We're okay. Nice to be here. Nobody knows me. The pastor doesn't know me. I'm from Texas and uh, grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, currently uh, in Chicago, uh, going to school. Uh, my family's down in San Antonio. We You know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I like what you're preaching because I'm attending Northwestern right now, University. And uh, friends, I'll tell you what. There's there's a real interest in this world today to diminish the value of the gospel by saying that Jesus is just another way. Now, I don't believe that. So, Pastor, I'm very interested in what you have to say this morning. I think it's right on target. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. We're interested in you being with us, too. Our brother's coming back and would like to start a home missions church in our section. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have you, Brother Jack, with us. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 9. Arise, get thee to Zerapath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a woman, a widow woman, there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zerapath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and he said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Now ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you something here. Everybody attributes this, this uh miracle to Elijah and to Elijah's relationship with God. But I have to go further than that. I attribute this miracle to this lady. God needs vessels wherewith to use. And we can have Billy Graham standing here or we can have Jesus standing here and if there's no vessels to be used, miracles won't happen. I'm convinced of that. God doesn't violate people's will. How many believes that? He doesn't violate a man's will. We've got to be usable vessels in the hands of the Lord. And when that happens, God can do things you never thought imaginable in this community. Let alone this church and in your individual family. Elijah said unto her, Fear not, verse 13. Don't be afraid, lady. Go and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, <laughs> neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. No wonder the assemblies of God have got to their feet this year and marked this year's emphasis on Pentecost. My Lord, help us not to let the crews go dry. Yeah. The church has done it over the years, a little by little by little. We've tried all kinds of things. 
to make churches grow and do what we want them to do. And it comes right back, mister, to the manifestation of the power of God. Without the Holy Ghost, it is just a form. Amen. It's just an activity. Yeah. And it'll never last. But you keep the cruise full. See, verse 15 says, she went and did. There, I think, was where the best was. Verse 15 says, this old lady, she could have said, well, I don't believe you. First of all, I don't know you. I've never laid eyes on you. Secondly, I don't believe this stuff you're saying. I have one hunk of cornmeal left, and I have just a little bit of oil in the bottom of the cruise, just enough to make it a decent mixture. How many has ever made hotcakes? I'll not forget when my, my stepmother my stepfather and mother, when I was just a little tight, went away for a week or something, and, and me and my twin brother was there. I told you about this probably, but I tried to make hotcakes, and we had hogs, you know, so we kept a five-gallon can in the corner of the kitchen. I don't know whether you'd do anything like that, but we did. And all the old food you didn't use, you dumped in there, and then you fed the hogs. After, after, after it was all done for the day, that was part of the feeding of the hogs. And, well, I filled that five-gallon can with pancakes that I couldn't get to cook. I was doing something wrong. I, I was mixing them and all, but I couldn't get them to cook. And every time I took them up out of there, they'd fall apart and the stuff would run out of them. Yuck. And I tried eating a couple of them and they made me sick, but I, I was hungry and I had the house full of smoke. Well, this little lady needed a little bit of oil to mix up that cornmeal so she could, or whatever that stuff was, and, and to make those cakes so she could put them on the grill and, and fry them, baby. See, that's all God. Oh, I oh, I'm glad for verse 15. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. How many believe God's our supply? Yeah. Don't you believe that today? I don't care what you're getting into. And again, I'm looking forward to meeting with Brother Jack. I'll tell you, it's not easy going out here into a town and starting a church out of nothing. It's not easy. But I'll tell you something, the cruise won't go dry. The meal barrel will never go empty. Because we don't supply it, God supplies it. And when we're in the will of God and the plan of God, God will never let you down. He'll never you down. It may get down to the bottom of that barrel and you think there's nothing left. Oh, and then comes the prophet. And he comes by and he says, give me a little bit to eat. I tell you, I'll never forget sitting at a truck stop. I've told you this over and over again. And that old dirty looking guy comes and sits beside me. And I had stopped at this truck stop to get a cup of coffee and get my eyes reopened so I could drive another hundred miles. And this guy sat there. The waitress didn't give him nothing to eat because he said, I don't have any money. Something inside said, get him his soup and get him his coffee. I got it for him when it was all done. He got up to walk away and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, sir, beware. You may be entertaining angels. Man, I'll tell you, every hair on my body stood straight up. I didn't know whether that could be a real angel or what it was, but it taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson. My God can be in everything I do from putting a bowl of soup on the table for somebody to eat to preaching in the pulpit. My God can be in the center of it. And He's my supply. He's my power. I remember an angel, real angel. See, there are real angels, you know. And I, I used to wonder if there was until my wife laid in her bed. The doctor had said she had some kind of growth inside of her. And that angel woke me up in the middle of the night, standing over her bed. That's been years ago. And said, don't fear. Well, I'm scared, plump to death. I pulled the cover over my head. I was sweating. I was trembling. And he said, get the cover off your head. Look at me. Said, I bring peace unto you. Your wife is healed. This is a message from the Lord Jesus Christ. That following Monday, this was on a Friday, that following Monday, we went back to the hospital and they could find nothing. It was all one. I'm convinced that my God is my provider. He's where I am. He's where I will be. He is where I used to be. Amen. Are you with me? So don't fear. You may be sitting in this church this morning and saying, I need a miracle. Then ask God that that miracle come through you. 
Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Come amen. through you. This is biblical, sir. This is biblical. And I believe, oh, I'm not taking away from God's ministers. I know James chapter 5 says, if there's any sick among you, let the elders of the church lay hands upon them, praying the prayer of faith. But there are times when you don't have any elders around. There's times when you don't have a church building. Can you say amen? There's times when there's no deacons within a hundred miles. Then what do you do? You do it yourself. Exactly right. And that's where the power comes from. When you stand up and say, in the name of the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ, I can be healed. Yeah. Yeah. You just simply pray for yourself. How many believe in that? Yeah. Yeah. You just simply pray for yourself. This is just old basic gospel. It doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot of light to do this kind of stuff. It just takes a touch of God. Just a touch of God. To get that done. Over in 2 Kings chapter 4, if you've got a moment, we'll hurry along and be done. I don't know how I can make a sermon in 10 minutes this long. Do you? But we managed to do it. 2 Kings chapter 4. First we talked about Elijah, how he dealt with this woman. And now we're going to talk about Elisha just for a moment. First, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. Beginning with verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets of Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come, to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. And then he said, Go, borrow three vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. How many remember that old song? Bring your house Well, we know how it goes, don't you? I forgot. I do just a little bit of it, and then I lost it here. Where was I? <coughs> Bring not a few. Verse 4. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, shut the door upon her. How many, ladies and gentlemen, how many times do we lose the touch of God? And we lose the provision of God because we have forgotten what it is to go in by ourselves and kneel down and intercede before God's face until God moves. Amen. Does what He wants to do. You can have 50,000 people anoint you with oil and nothing will happen. And you can walk in, shut the door behind you, and get on your knees and say, I'm not leaving this room until God answers me. Yes. How many is experienced? I have. Amen. I have. And God does it. Yes. He'll open the door when there is no door. He'll shut the door when it needs to be shut. Amen. He'll provide when there is no provision because that's my God. See, God doesn't have to provide for you if you have provision. He already provided that already. Everything you and I have is His. Amen. And what's His is ours. Amen. But it's when you have nothing that God is your provider. I, I'm a firm believer. Yes. I'm a firm believer. Not only just take care of me all day long, and I breathe, and I eat, and I live, and I am alone because of Him. But it's when I'm down and out, and I can't do any more myself. That's when He says, if you see me. I think the Holy Spirit even mentioned that in the through, through us in, in the interpretation. You see, you'll find. You simply ask, no matter what your petition is, and you'll get it. I don't believe in that. I really am. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, verse 6 says, And it came to pass when the vessel was when to go back. So she went from him, verse 5, shut the door upon her, on her sons, who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. Came to pass, the vessels were full, that she said unto her sons, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. It stayed right there. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Okay, go sell the oil. Pay thy debt. And live thou and thy children. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
He is not only my provider in this one little instance where I don't have enough money to pay a bill, but he's my provider tomorrow if tomorrow comes. If the next day comes, I don't worry because he's my provider. I know when I wake up in the morning, if I'm right with God, if I'm right with God, if my sins are under the blood, then I can wake up in the morning and know I'll not face anything that God's not facing with me. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. And nothing I will go through that he doesn't go through with me. And supply so that to me. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. I can preach for an hour. I've already preached 40 minutes. I get the whole oh, praise the Lord. I feel his presence here. Amen. How many know what I'm preaching? It's just Amen. sort of basic, but it's a gospel. Amen. It's the gospel. Number two, not only talking about the little widow women, talking about a little boy with, I'm not going to read it. You know it. Study this in Sunday school. Matthew chapter 14, 15 through 21 is one text. A little boy with a bag of lunch. You know, I, I just can't, still can't get over the disciples. They looked at Jesus and said, "We be hungry. We be we 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 be uh, how is it? We hunger. We hunger." Jesus said, "Go eat." <laughs> that tickles me. That just tickles me good. You know? Jesus looked at him and didn't say, "Well, oh my goodness, oh my, I never thought, I never thought. Do we have enough to eat?" No, he just said, "Go eat." What was Jesus trying to do? trying to get his disciples to do what I'm preaching. Am I correct? That's exactly what he was trying to do. Trying to get his disciples to act on faith and, and do, but Jesus still led them. Jesus still led them and he saw the miracle happen. I'm convinced that whether it be fish or bread, or whether it be cancer in your body or a lack of a home to live in, my Jesus is able to supply all that. And he does. Time and time and time again, he is able. You're in this church this morning. Just a, a just a about half of our congregation is here, and, and you're sitting in this congregation. And I know some of you have come into this church this morning, feeling like, where am I going to get the provision? Let me just leave it with you again. God wants to use. Hey, I don't have nothing. How can God use me, Pastor? I don't have nothing. How can God use me? I'm the one that's sick. God sent me the answer. The answer is already with you. The Bible says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. Am I correct? Thirdly, I noticed Moses at the burning bush. And I like this, so I'm going to read these two verses. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verses 21 and 22. Here's what it said. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. The burning bush was in Exodus 3. How many agree? Thank you. You won't hurt my feelings. Exodus 3, verses 2 through 4, tells us about him stretching forth his hand. And the water separated. And it became a wall on each side. And now I'm going to go just a step further. The burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 and 4. Now, write down Exodus 21, uh, Exodus 14, 21 and 22. That talks about the Red Sea. And then go back to Exodus chapter 3. Notice these two verses. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Everybody looks at the miracle of the bush. I want to go a step further. I want to go further than the burning bush. 
I want to go further than the voice of God. I want to go to the man Moses. We, we exclude that over and over and over again. We exclude that out of this miracle. We can't exclude the vessel that God needs. Can you say amen? amen? We can't exclude that. And Moses said, I will now turn aside. There it is. Right there. I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, there it is. When God saw he turned aside, I'm convinced that the miracle here, the tremendous part of this miracle was that God initiated this calling because he turned aside to see. If he had not turned aside, it seems to apply to me. If he had kept on walking, he'd have never got called. How many agree? He'd have never got called. Because God needed an instrument. God needed a vessel. Praise the Lord. You still with me? Okay, we're just about done. God, when he can't use people, he'll use things. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. <laughs> God got really down to the nitty gritty here. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, you'll notice beginning with verse 1. And with your permission, I'd like to read just a few verses here of this. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the ark was bringing so much sorrow to the Philistines, the Philistines had conquered and took the ark into their possession. Well, the ark is, is insignificant to the presence of God. Well, the presence of God was sort of in foreign place when it was in the Philistines' camp. Because they were surrounded by all their stone gods. They had this special room set up, and in this room was all these stone gods. Well, every day they'd go out, and, and, and they'd look, and they'd go to worship, and, and as long as the ark was there, the, the stone gods would be on their face in the ground. They're big, they're heavy, enormous tons. Spirit of God says, I'm the only one you're going to worship, whether it be in the Philistine camp, or whether it be in Israel. When my presence is here, you don't worship anybody else. And they wanted to get rid of the ark. So what did God provide? Listen to it. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistine seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, the soothsayers, the witches. What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we, we shall send it to his place. And they said, if he send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty. <laughs> you don't get that, man. <laughs> that tickles me. You know, people think they've got to pay for religion. You know, have you ever met anybody like that? You know, I'm going to get to heaven because I pay my tithe. Baloney! You'll get to heaven because you pay them, but because you're a Christian. That's why you'll get to heaven. Because you're saved. And they said, if we send away the ark of God of Israel, send away not empty, but in any wise, we turn him a treasure offering. Then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds and, and images of your mice, that made uh, the lamb. I got this thing so marked up. I can't read. This Bible's got small. Will you bear with me? Amen. I just picked up the nearest Bible I had. Amen. And images of your mites that made that uh, are in the land, and ye shall give glory unto God of Israel. Peradventure, he will lighten his hand from off you, and from off your gods, and from off your land. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians, and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among you? them. Did they not let the people go? And they depart. Now therefore make a new cart. Now listen to this. We have no, nothing else we can use. There wasn't any godly people there to use. So he used two cows. I'm never reading. He used two cows. I'm not going to read the rest of them. I'll tell you what they did. 
Those cow cows were with calves. So they took the calves away from the cows, and they took them on down through the country, and they hid them in a barn. And they hooked the ark, the cart, and the ark, with the ark on it, to the two cows, and said, okay, let them go. See, the Lord's intention was to get the ark back to Israel. And if you read down to verse 16, it'll tell you that those old cows just started walking. Not nobody leading them or nothing. And they hauled that ark straight back to Israel. And the people looked up and they saw them two cows coming, pulling that ark. And the Bible says that they begin to rejoice. Here comes the ark. Here comes the presence of the Lord. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God needs a vessel. Now, I don't know if you, if you see what I'm getting at. If God doesn't get it from you and me, He'll use something else. I can take it to another portion of Scripture. I won't read it this morning. But God even uses donkeys. You remember in Sunday school how God, how God spoke through that donkey? That this, that this man of God could not perceive that there was an angel standing there. But that donkey saw it. I remember the manna, the quail. Numbers chapter 22, read it sometime. Balaam's donkey. Oh, okay. and ladies and gentlemen, and as I close this morning, Jesus is saying to us in this church right now, I'll use you if you wish. That's as plain as I can say it. I'll use you if you wish. <coughs> I'll move through your life if you'll let me do it. Pastor, I'm not worthy who is. I don't know when I'm going to preach it, but I had a sermon I was going to preach this morning. I really thought, I thought it was even confirmed. You know what that means, don't you? Things that happen during the week seem to confirm that message, but God really spoke to my heart this morning and said it's not enough to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to feel a move of God. After we get filled with the Holy Ghost and get a touch of God, let's be instruments of the power of God. Young people, boy, God moved all you kids last Sunday night and some of our adults around these altars. I'll tell you something. God wants to use us as instruments of righteousness. God wants to do miracles through our lives. And I'll tell you what we're going to do in just a moment. These altars are open to anybody and whosoever will come. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I felt led to do this from the time that God spoke to me about this sermon. If you're here in this church today, I want you simply to stand where you are. Pastor, I've got a need. I don't know how to get through this. I don't know how to get through this physical ailment. I don't know how to get through this habit. I don't know how to get my life on track to where I know I'm living in complete victory. If you stand, we're going to ask people to lay hands on you and pray in the name of Jesus wherever you are. <coughs> Believe God. <coughs> You'll be there. What I'm trying to say is this. Pastor, what if... What if I don't feel that I can do that? And can I say this reverently? And would you please come and kneel at this altar? <coughs> Seek the Lord until you can receive that power. And it doesn't happen just in one moment. It happens day after day after day of walking in the Spirit. Pastor, do we need that today? If we're going to live in this last this last decade of harvest, and I'll tell you folks, and I think our brother will agree with me, this decade of harvest needs to escalate. It needs to get moving. We're in the middle of this decade, and we're not seeing what we felt we wanted to see. And I, I believe I can attribute, I'm, I don't know everything, but I believe this, God cannot move without vessels. Or He could, but He doesn't choose to. He's got to have vessels to work with. There's got to be prayer partners. There's got to be ministers, young men and women called to the ministry. There's got to be churches opened up. There's got to be altars. I love that book and I let some of our pastoral staff read it. Back to the altar. How many's read it? By our own man. Back to the altar. Why? Lord, help us. We'll get back to the altar. There's where you find the ability to be a vessel. 
You get so filled with the power of God, nothing's too big for you. Nothing's too tremendous. Because you know you have God on your side. We need miracles. Yes, we do. We need miracles today. And I'm convinced this little sermon I wrote this morning, I know it could have been a lot better, but I'm convinced this morning that God, if He don't use us, He'll use a cow. If He doesn't use us, He'll use a donkey. If He doesn't use us, He'll use something out there to get His work done because He's coming back soon and this world's got to be touched for Jesus' sake. And I'm convinced as little as Mount Morris is, the percentage of people that are unsaved in this town that could care less about God is so tremendous. Why in the world are we ever going to reach these people? We've got to be so Spirit-filled that miracles begin to emanate through us and work through us. God is seen through you. Unless God can be seen through you, God will not be seen. Would you value that? A lot of people got mad that day when Jesus began to speculate. took the church leaders back through history and only showed them two examples. They didn't solve them. Two examples out of thousands of people that allowed God to use them. The Bible says they took him, they took him out to the edge of the blood and would have cast him down over there and killed him. Somehow he slipped out of the midst. <coughs> If you're here this morning and you'd like for God to begin to use you, you need a miracle. <coughs> Listen, folks. It don't stop with you getting your miracle. If God gives you a miracle, then He wants you to become an instrument so that others might have miracles. Thus, your message becomes a message of power and influence. Touching others. If you're here today, to stand in your feet. Pastor, I walked into this church. I don't know what the answer is. I need a miracle.